All right, everybody, welcome back to another interview for MTG Fun. Uh, today I'm here with Justine Mara Anderson, Anderson, and uh, Mara, she's Mara. coming. Go ahead. Justine Mara Anderson. Mara Anderson, my bad. I'm just uh, getting to know her myself. This is the first time we've spoken. So uh, uh, usually in these interviews, the, the point is to try to get to know someone, their art and what what uh, has motivated them in their in their career. Um, so Justine, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what got you interested in art? Well, it was really simple. I, it was so funny because when I was in school, um, I was sort of lousy at everything everybody was good at. And I kind of thought, as a child, like an eight-year-old, what am I gonna do? And I thought, I know I'll draw. It was really just a reaction because I was just so unpopular in school. I didn't know what else to I do with myself. <laughs> And it occurred to me, well, I think people who are unpopular draw. You know, I mean, that was sort of, it was like a, that childish impulse. And uh, in fourth grade, I just sort of announced, I'm either going to be a comic book artist or a dolphin trainer. Oh. But when my mother informed me that to be a dolphin trainer, I would have to study math as part, you know, as part of the science thing, I mm -hmm. thought, well, I don't want to do that. So I decided to draw. It was really, it's funny how simple it was. And then there were a couple of things that really just kept pushing me along. You know, I, I got really obsessed with uh, Universal Monster movies and things yeah. like that. You know, I loved that stuff. Not so much for the monsters, but it was a world of fantasy. It took me out yeah. of what I was in, right? And then when um, I saw the Rankin Bass version of The Hobbit. Oh, right. Great, great, great movie. It just totally... That was it. I, from that point on, I was obsessed with all things fantastical. And, and that would have been, I probably saw it the same year as I saw the original Star Wars. You know, so those two things kind of hit and just, you know, I already knew I was going to be a comic book artist. But when I saw those two things from that point forward, I knew what kind of art I wanted to do. And then, of course, Dungeons and Dragons came out. So all the unpopular kids <laughs> you know, all the guys and gals that couldn't date were playing D&D, &D, right? So right, that was yeah. me. Uh, and, and I never thought to myself, oh, one day I'll work for Dungeons and Dragons. One day I'll work for Lucasfilm. That sort of never really occurred to me. But one day I'll do comics. That occurred to me. Sure. And as it turned out, I did all of it. You know, I ended up working for Dungeons and Dragons and doing stuff for Lucasfilm and, wow. you know, uh, doing stuff for DC Comics and... Mm -hmm. uh, now just whatever comes my way, you know, I've done stuff for Universal Studios for the ET ride years ago. Oh, wow. and, um, awesome. You know, I wasn't allowed to sign it or they'd sue me. It was a strange situation, but um, <laughs> a lot of stuff like that. And then since I've lived in Gainesville, well, I'm going on, I'm going, I'm sorry, I'm going way, way off your question. Oh, no, that's totally fine. What really got me going was all that. And then there was one more transformative moment as I saw Frank Thorne's Gita of Alazar. Oh, yeah. um, and Frank Thorne, of course, did Red Sonia and all that kind of stuff. And that was the first time I'd ever really seen an erotic comic where the woman was developed as a woman. She wasn't just sort of an object of, you know, desire, which um, personally, I don't have a problem with that kind of thing in fiction. I, I separate my fantasies from my fiction, from my realities. So I don't have a problem with that. But what if you know, it's not, it's not like I have a feminist agenda against that, I don't. Um, I think fantasies are sacred and you should enjoy whatever you love. But when I saw Frank Thorne's Gita, I thought, oh, you can actually have a real female character, you know, in this, these fantasy worlds doing things other than being a victim, you know? And, and right. I just thought, this, that, so I really thought, I want to do like erotic comics like that. So I did that for a number of years as well. Okay. Uh, and I'm returning to that. I just did it. You know, I took, I did my erotic book for 15 years and I've taken 10 or 15 years off and I just finished a new one that Fanagraphics is going to publish. Interesting. So I've had kind of a lot of influences, but it's always been about worlds of fantasy, fantastical, yeah. science fiction, erotic, you know, but things that where you know, there's a bit of character in it, something you can grab onto and relate to. Yeah, I, I noticed there, there's a lot of that in the fantasy realm. Um, I'm listening to a book right now called The Dragonbone Chair. And even in that book, there's, you know, which is quoted to be an early 
uh, influence of Tolkien and some of the others that oh, you know, okay. it, it, uh, it still had some of that in it. So that's quite interesting. Um, so you say going into fourth grade, you had kind of decided that you're going to be an artist. What are, what are some of the things that you did from then to prepare yourself for a career in art? Like classes you took maybe or practicing well, and things like that. As a kid, all I did was I tried to redraw a movie scene to King Kong or just mm -hmm. whatever I was seeing, right? But then I went to, it was high school. I just, I was terrible. I couldn't draw at all. I had this ambition to be an artist, but I had no talent. Uh, absolutely zero talent. Um, everyone says, oh yes, you had to, no, I didn't. I mean, anyone will remember, they all tried to stop me from becoming an artist because I had so little talent going into it. But then I went to college and again, they told me, yeah, you really don't have any talent. You're gonna have to do something else. So for me, it was a struggle because I didn't have that gift for drawing. I had to work for it. And then I had a chance meeting with P. Craig Russell and uh in kent kent ohio and i just invited myself over to his house so he could look at my shitty work and um, <laughs> for some reason he agreed to this so and then he became my first mentor awesome. and you know then he passed me along to val merrick who was oh, yeah. working with conan and punisher and all that and yeah. i stayed under val merrick for a long time mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately i wasn't getting any better and they they talked me into dropping out of school college mm -hmm. and learning from them which i did and then okay. after a year or so they said honey you're not getting it so um maybe you should go back to college and do something mm -hmm. else you know but this is how little talent i had that i had all these breaks and i just wasn't rising to the occasion i was working constantly on drawing but my drawings weren't getting any better and then ultimately all that work at one point it just paid off when i went back mm -hmm. to college um, because all that stuff I'd been working on, I internalized. And even though it wasn't coming out on the paper, it was becoming part of me. And it was at some point when I went back to college, all that stuff that I'd been shoving in there that wasn't coming out was suddenly coming out on the paper. And I just blossomed really quickly. And it wasn't, it wasn't unfounded. You know, I'd laid all this groundwork of studying anatomy and working constantly and doing the stuff that isn't fun, learning about shapes and volumes, and, you know, all those things that artists don't want to do anymore because it's too hard, you know? Right. And so I did all that and it was very frustrating because it was, it was like a magical moment when suddenly it was all on the paper. And um, hmm. so then I got work from Eclipse Comics and I dropped out of college again. And then I, from that point on, I was trying to work my way into the mainstream, but mm -hmm. I was also still being mentored. So Craig and Val were taught, were mentored by Dan Adkins, as I understood it. Mm -hmm. And you know, Dan Adkins was, I think one of the first artists to work on Doctor Strange. You yeah. know, so that was the one that taught them. So then Val took me out to meet Dan. Oh, wow. And while I'm talking to Dan, Dan mentions that he was mentored by Wally Wood. Mm -hmm which unfortunately Wally Wood is dead, so I didn't get to meet Wally Wood. Yeah, that's, okay. that's sort of the lineage, you know, me, yeah. Val Craig, Dan, Wally Wood. Yeah. And I never thought about my lineage as being all that important until I was sitting with my favorite director, a French director, Jean Rollin, who directed a lot of uh, exploitation vampire type movies back in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. um, terrific, great drive and stuff. French, you know, erotica kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, he looked at my work and said, oh, your work, it looks like a Wally Wood. Do you know his work? Oh. And I thought, wow, it's, you know, even though I never met Wally, that lineage is showing through the work I'm doing. Yeah, the influences came through. That's, it is that's coming right. through. And on that right. same trip, um, Dan said, do you want to meet Jim? You mean like your neighbor Jim, the guy who mows your lawn, Jim? Jim Steranko showed up. Oh, wow. And so Jim gave me this 90-minute in-depth penetrating review of all my work and it was the mm. most astounding it blew my mind jim jim stranko's insight was it was mystical i mean he was like he just yeah. he saw through everything and then i began sending stuff to jim and talking to jim on the phone and dan and val and craig and on that same trip i finally got to bed, go spend about a week with frank thorne so i spent time with him and then yep. he introduced me to john workman who was the art director at Eddie metal back when it was relevant <laughs> and uh, short, shortly after that, I met Jeff Jones, the great Jeff Jones. Mm -hmm. And then Jeff started mentoring me. 
So really what I did was I kind of just got in with all these great masters mm -hmm. and rather than having them get me into the business, they all helped me develop my skills. Sure. And then after that, it was when I finally got a break at DC Comics and everything took off from there. It's kind of That's a long awesome. story, but um, no. I think it's interesting uh, because these are all legends that, um, to say it here, it sounds like name dropping and bragging because we all know who they are, but out mm -hmm. in public, nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a tight knit community. I mean, yeah, I can't talk yeah. about stuff in general. I can't go out, you know, hanging out somewhere in public and they ask me about what I do and how I got there. Nobody knows the names. So it's nice right. to be in a situation where people might actually see how cool it is that I got yeah. to learn from all these amazing people. And I think that's what shows in my work. A lot of the open space in my current Magic the Gathering cards. It's not because I don't want to draw lots of detail. I love drawing lots of noodly detail, but I'm also in love with that Jeff Jones, open air, sparse kind of thing. Right. You know, and so that's where a lot of that look comes from. It's that little bit of that Jeff Jones minimalism and then, you know, focusing the details in certain areas rather than Absolutely. spreading it all over the page. So um, that's a long winded answer and I'll try to bring them down some. So this no, that's that that, you know that that's what we were looking for with that question you know kind of get through your your hierarchy your you know the the path you traveled to to accomplish what you've gotten to today I mean it it's different for everyone but I think the the key there is that you persevered by by continuing to work and work hard I mean even those that have talent I know it requires a lot of work to develop that talent so I mean yeah. it's not a it's not an easy life for anyone all the illustrators i talk to and all artists that i talk to have that in common i think is there's a lot of hard work involved and i think success in general and in, in whatever field you come into requires that effort so i appreciate that, that i do a lot of teaching and i just can't get my students nowadays to take an interest in doing the stuff that's not fun and you know that's the thing that's so frustrating is they don't yeah. want to study the anatomy. They don't want to do the not fun stuff. They just want to right. stick the self-expression. And for me, that is that that to me is a dead end. To them, that's that's mm -hmm. what they love. But you know, to me, I'm thinking, you know, you you want to be versatile and you want to have a you know a large groundwork of fundamentals to work from. Right. Uh, so what I basically say is if you're one of those people who really wants to do this, but says, Oh God, I could never do that, I don't have any talent, um, that's just an excuse. Right. Because talent is irrelevant. Um, right. What you need to do is you need to learn the discipline of being able to commit to the stuff that's not fun and of being willing to commit to years of frustration when everything you're learning isn't showing up on the page. Right. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a major commitment, sacrifice, and discipline. And not many people are willing to give those three things. Well, and, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it, it's not so much about the talent again it it comes down to the hard work and and putting in the effort i mean when when i see artists that are successful one of the key things that i i always see they're doing whether it's through social media or whatever they're however they're sharing their process they're still doing drawing forms and they're still you know taking classes of that nature and you know it it definitely is a formula that goes through you know all these genres, whether it be fantasy or comic or, yeah, or all yeah. the, the different types of art, fine art. I mean, it all boils down to the basics of drawing and figures and shapes. And no, so. I've had a few students that have seen the line, but not that many, you know? Yeah, yeah, so makes anyway. sense. Well, kind of a segue, you mentioned your, your foray into magic. Um, what kind of got you started doing illustration for D&D &D and, and some of those things that brought you into magic? Well, I first ended up doing a D and D book a long time ago. I don't even remember when. Uh, and then, but that relationship was strained. The person I worked with, I didn't like very much, and I, he kind of creeped me out a little bit. And um, I don't remember his name. And it's it's okay because he's gone anyway. And then years later, my dream of working in comics was collapsing out from under me because I got into comics during the boom and then the crash. Um, I got in right then, boom, crash, right? Tough time, um, yeah. The crash was, I was in the middle of the crash and I was scared because I have yeah. no other skills. 
you know, oh, you've got a drawing degree, ma'am, take cab number five. I mean, you, you know, it doesn't leave you a lot of career options. Right. And so I kind of just started trying to move sideways into something else. And I sent packages to Don Murin. Oh, yeah. Uh, the art director. And um, right. oh, it was a very long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. Over 20 years ago, probably. I mean, uh, and then... Um, I did that for a while and that got me in with Lucasfilm and, you know, with Peter Whitley on Dragon Magazine and that got me into the Lucasfilm connection on Star Wars Insider and Star Wars Gamer. And so I was doing all that work. And then out of the blue, what well, Wizards of the Coast sort of everything crashed there too. And they laid off Peter Whitley and they laid off my other art director I worked with and Don Neuron got moved into a position where she wasn't hiring artists. And I was suddenly ground just ground zero there was nothing left for me i had no connections in the business and i thought gee i just don't want to start over again at all i don't want to go through this again um so i took two years off and didn't do any drawing and i moved to asia oh. and i just taught english in south korea and then in south america didn't draw anything for two years nothing mm -hmm. uh, and then i came back to it when jeff jones died uh, I, I just started drawing again because I, I just felt this impulse with Jeff Jones dying that I needed to draw again sure. uh, because I was trying to reconnect with Jeff when Jeff died, but Jeff was, had become sort of reclusive and hard to find and um, it, I wasn't connecting. I found out later that I shouldn't have taken that personally because Jeff was uh, really struggling, you know? Yeah, that's hard. So when I found out Jeff Jones died, I was devastated because I never reconnected. I never got to say goodbye in any way. Uh, so I started drawing again. And then what happened was uh, last year, I thought, you know, I don't want a dog eat dog struggle back into this business again. It's, mm -hmm. it's too hard, it's too difficult. And I, you know, I had the company job teaching, it's pleasant enough. I like, you know, even though I haven't had students that like the kind of things I do, yeah, I still like, you know, being in that environment just fine. I just, mm -hmm. they're, they're more into the independent comics thing, which is just not my bag. I love great drawing, you know, and, um, but I started thinking I need to move on into something else because first of all, I need some money. And so I sent to Don Huron an old email address that I thought, oh, there's no way this 20 year old email address could still be good. And I sent to her because we had a great working relationship. I didn't know if she yeah. still worked there. I didn't know anything. I oh, just found wow. the email address and sent it out. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't really have anything, but your new work looks great. I'll let you know if I see anything. And then mm -hmm. about a month or two later, she said, hey, great news. Oh, We're trying wow. this experiment. Do you want in? I'm like, oh, <laughs> hell yeah, I want in. And so I got in, and the work was well received. And, mm -hmm. um, and I got offered something else, which starts up later this summer. But oh, I'm wow. not at liberty to talk about it. But um, right, yeah, yeah. There's, there oh. will be more to come. That's great, yeah. So it was really just... Um, contacting an old, you know, an old client that I had lost track of and saying, hey, I want to do this again. Would That's you have me? And then after, then after that, I contacted Fanta Graphics. And I said, I just finished this Mara book. Do you want it? And they mm -hmm. said, yes. And then US contacted at us to the school I teach at, the Sequential Artist Workshop. Tom Hart runs mm -hmm. it. Um, great place. Uh, it's, it's more to, it's less tuned to tour from the illustration thing that I do and more towards the independent sort of diary, you know, memoir comic type thing, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can still teach fundamental drawing stuff there, but that's not really their area of interest. So I'm still teaching there, but Tom got me work at UF. So now I'm working for University of Florida on this oh, well. long, long term project of doing these sort of comics themed illustrated textbooks that are also interactive online. So oh. it's just sort of really innovative. Um, in an innovative project that you know like i'm doing these sort of more cartoony based kind of things oh yeah uh-huh yeah we can see that that's cool so anyway um so that's the stuff that i'm working on now and mm -hmm. i've got did the more magic gathering i've got magic the gathering coming um you know i've got fan of graphics picking up my book so i'm suddenly having like a third act in my career that's amazing how it just kind of snowballs you know spider webs you know one channel leads into others and it picks up so i'm glad to hear that things are going well in that area yeah, it's exciting. i'm sorry yeah. my answers are all so long but 
He's no, hard. you're you're good. I, I, that's what, at least to me, is interesting about doing these to get to know the artists and and who they really are from the ground up. You know, it's it's, yeah. it's great. Um, so what? Why don't you share with us some of your process with some of the magic art? Sure. You said you had a screen share that you could share with us. Yeah, I do. Um, let me, oh, screen share. Let me do that first. Uh, awesome. So just so people understand what the process looks like, because I don't know how many artists share that. Um, these start yeah. out as pencils. And when I started this one out, um, I was going with a more straightforward wolf because I didn't understand the art direction. Sometimes the art direction until I get a feel for how, how they're written, sometimes I misread them. And, you know, there's always a bit of a break-in period. I love the drawing, you know. And then yeah. after that, I, I ink it, right? So what I have for sale, if I were to sell them, would just be these inked pieces. But I guess the okay. black and white ones aren't fetching that high a price. So I don't know if I want to sell them or not. I'll, I'll, let me think about it for a few days. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I mean. The, they liked it, but they, they wanted some adjustments to it made. And they also wanted to flip it, which... I always okay. hate seeing my work flip because when you flip them, um, they they usually go all out of proportion and everything. All the mistakes you've made are enhanced. One of the ways <laughs> artists can tell if there's something wrong with their work is to hold it up to a mirror. Then you can see oh. how wonky the anatomy is and how weird the perspective is and all that Interesting. stuff. But yeah, somehow, I heard that when flip, yeah, when I flipped my drawings, they, they held up which yeah. Don Murin said, that's a testament to your mad drawing skills. So I wouldn't <laughs> say that about myself, but since she said it, I'd yeah. get away with it. And that's then she great. sent this note telling me what adjustments they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so then I did a patch that I glued on top. I didn't actually glue them okay. on top. I drew them separately and put them in, in Photoshop okay. and then um, work on the color. And that's sort of what the finished card looks like. Yeah. Uh, unless they went with this bolder one which is still uncropped. You can see it's uncropped, right? So that's more like the cropping that would be on the card. Yeah, that looks more like the final image there from my recollection. So so you did the final digital coloring and, and changes yeah, in, in Photoshop? Yeah. yeah, I used to do everything in watercolor, but I thought that, you know, I haven't watercolored in so long, I feared I was rusty. And uh, I always call watercolor a series of barely controlled mistakes. So. <laughs> yeah. I, from the classes I've taken in watercolor, that's that sounds about right. And that's the Groon one, um, unless they renamed it. They had all these code names for everything. Yeah, but they code can, named the set Cricket, right? <laughs> yeah, they did. Um, and so that's what it looked like inked, and then they wanted it yeah. flipped. Yeah. And you know, miraculously, once again, it held up flipped. Yeah, it looks great. I'll so look that's great. my process, and then uh, yeah. this was the prize finder, I believe. Yeah. So as as a so this one ended up being called Parcel Beast. Okay. Um, that that I know because it's actually one of my favorite cards from the set. Uh, I, I play mm -hmm. online quite a bit, and this is one that I like to draft because okay, it, cool. it's a really good card. Okay, so that's what it looks like inked, you know? Yeah. Um, pretty nice. And then I colored, we colored it, or I colored it in a way that's where the creature is closer to what the creature in there um, their sort of style guide looked like, uh -huh. but you know, did one that was slightly bolder just so that it would right. pop more. And yeah. but I sent them two because usually they want things pretty much close, pretty close to their reference. Sure. And so I thought, oh, if I send them this, they're not going to like it. So I sent them this one as well, and they ended up picking the red one, which was odd because they usually go with the one that's closer to what you're familiar with. Um, well, and the fun thing about that is, is that creature is actually so. If you know much about the colors of magic, they have five exactly. colors. Um, this oh, one's okay. actually blue and green, so there's oh. a little bit of the blue showing up, but not as much of the green, but it, it turned out great. Okay. Yeah. And then that, of course, is the Star X, I guess. And yeah. yeah. I really like that one. I live out in the forest here, so my I have floor-to-ceiling wall-to-wall windows and a panoramic view right next to me outside my other, on my nice. other window, and there's always deer right outside my window when oh. I'm drawing. Uh, oh, wow. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful does that walk right up to the window and look in. Uh -huh. So yeah. I'm constantly looking at wildlife. We get bald eagles flying overhead and oh, armadillos wow. and hawks and wild turkey, you know. 
Yeah, I, I've, I've been trying to convince my wife to move to Florida, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, there's there's two Floridas. There's the Florida everybody makes fun of, and there's the Florida that I live in. Yeah, I have I have several friends and and people I know that live there, and they all make up the actual Florida, not the Florida yeah. man posts you hear about. You know, Florida, this this this, uh, this piece is actually my favorite of the set. I think it's everybody. Yeah, the legendary creature turned out really well it was also turned the wrong way but since this uh, one was based on human anatomy i ended up tracing it the other way uh, so okay. that um so that if it fell apart because of the if the humanness i was afraid that uh -huh. if i just flipped it when i was finished it would would look terrible so right. i actually um, redrew it on i traced it on a light box okay. and then that's the finished pencils yeah the, the detail difference is just striking well, that's because, see, if they decide to change something at this level and they said they want it flipped, now I'm yeah. screwed. You know, now, right. I've got, you know, now I've got to redraw the details. So right. it, it, this part in the process, what I did was I sent them basic sketches like that because I didn't want to devote all that time to the details and then have them make a change and have right. me have to redraw the details. So I, I have actually other sketches like this for all the rest of them, but I didn't scan them. Um, huh. But you can see in this one the total process. Right. Which I like this one too. It oddly it wasn't my favorite, but it seems to have been the favorite. It's sort of becoming my favorite. Well, I think the reason one of the reasons it's one of the more popular ones is because it's a legendary creature and it's yeah. it's it's more dynamic in that sense. But, oh, I thought it was my fabulous drawing. Um that too, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So All of them turned out very, very amazing. So, so that's the inked one. Yeah. Which, you know, it's cool because when you look at that, you can actually see the washiness. Of well, the it, in the final art of the card, you, you only get from basically where he's holding the orb up. Yeah. It's all cropped. So seeing that full image is actually really awesome. Yeah, that, that's, that's superb. Yeah. Very cool. And of course, there's the card. Um, yeah, so I mean, you can, you, you can see what I mean. You, the card, you really only get in the upper half. I mean, you can see a little bit yeah. through the text box, but you know, you don't get the full scope. So that's really cool. I'm just gonna flip through these because these are other things yeah. I've done that may be of interest. Yeah, I won't talk absolutely. about them at night. Um, if you want to ask a question, ask a question, but I don't want yeah, to take so up Barbarella, time. tell us a little bit briefly about that project. I don't know how I got that. I think actually, um, John Workman, I you okay. know, John Workman I've known for a long time. I said, John, who can I contact? I need, I need to uh -huh. work again. And yeah. he had me, you know, contact the art director on the Barbarella comics. And uh -huh. I did that cover and everybody was thrilled with it. And then they never hired me again. And I can't figure oh. that one out. You know, I did work, they were happy, we were happy, the relationship seemed good, but I was never able to get anything more out of them. That happens. Yeah, I, I hear that often. I, you know, I, I find that in my in industry too, you know, I'll do work for someone in the real estate industry and think I did a good job and then never hear back. So yeah. Yeah, I'm just a little puzzled by it. I'm not bad mouthing yeah. anybody yet, but I'm confused yeah and that was something we did for a local uh for the city which okay. was based on hal foster's prince valiant comics yeah we did a whole series of like satires of the great comics yeah uh, not satires that made fun of but satires that praised them although to tell you the truth this is all hal foster but this was just an excuse to drop <laughs> camera you know i love i love the gamma the giant turtle especially the yeah. ones that came out in the 90s and 2000s there was that gamma trilogy and right. I just, I wanted a cheap excuse to draw Gamera. <laughs> well, That's there you go. Inking, uh, Superman, Superman and whatnot for mm -hmm. DC. That was exciting. Being able to ink, finally get to ink the major characters. That's awesome. Um, that's my own trippy psychedelic memoir comic that I shelved and never finished. Huh. I did about a hundred pages and decided that I just don't want to watch my life being critiqued, objected, bought, sold, or ignored. So I just put it aside. Um, of course, that's one of my Lucasfilm drawings. One of my oh yeah, I remember drawings. seeing this one on your website. Yeah, yeah and that's my character Mara. Every uh -huh. now and then, I had so much work going that I couldn't work on my own character. I'd throw her into the background. Nice. So I made, I made Mara part of the Lucasfilm industry. And you know, they probably own her now. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. And that was one of my favorites. Droopy McCool and Sai Sunul, some of my favorite characters. Yeah, I love was, Return of the Jedi. I mean, this was a dream come true, you know, getting, yeah. this is the stuff that, you know, got me through high school and grade school and yeah. all that, right? So here suddenly I'm actually doing work for Lucas, you know, that was That's an amazing, awesome. 
amazing thing. That's another one from that comics thing that we did where we were painting. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, That's and I had to. I tried to get it just like Peanuts. As right. Close as I could. Well, yeah, changing the character, tell the making influence. Charlie Brown a girl, and making the Snoopy character look different. And yeah, that's an interesting take. That's kind of a self-portrait. That's me. Uh. <laughs> that's the founder of our school down there. Okay. And that's of course, awesome. we got Florida boiled peanuts. That's just my cartooning. Ah, uh, okay. Because you know, I love to do squid to smoking kind of cigars. Of, definitely, I yeah. Rock. <laughs> I love to do I, uh, <laughs> I love to do a variety of styles, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is why I try to teach my students, you know, make the sacrifice, learn the fundamentals, and then you'll be able to do anything. Yeah. You know, I mean, being able to go from that Aluna illustration to this sort of Flintstones type thing is sure. pretty cool. Um, that's the historical illustrations I did for a documentary. Uh, that's a really cool piece. It was the last the interview Johnny Cash ever did was for that movie. Oh. So, wow really cool to be in a movie with Johnny Cash. <laughs> yeah. On the wood <laughs> Very green. Directly, yeah, the, but the yeah. detail is really sweet. Well, it's based on uh, my, my, my grandfather was born and raised in a log cabin in West Virginia. So okay. I had family photos of the log cabin and my great grandfather, who was a moonshiner sitting out on the patio. He didn't look like that, but you know, I kind of used the background yeah, as an influence for sure. My family home. That's great. That's something Ooh, I did recently cool. with it. That's for the historical museum in town. I did that for them uh -huh. in Gainesville, Florida. The uh, the hair on the top of his head almost looks like peacock feathers in a way. Well, they are because it's oh. a, a tribute. It's a tribute to um, Narasimha, who is a okay. Hindu deity. I'm a practicing Hindu. Um, well, I'm glad I didn't screw that reference up. <laughs> yeah, Narasimha. I, I can was see that. Yeah. The, the man, the lion headed man, kind of like a like a like a minotaur, but a lion instead. In the Indian version, instead of a bull, it's a lion's head. But Shiva also took this form in the Shiva Puran, which is oh, right, yeah. one of the great Yeah, I, I spent some time in, uh, in uh, Cambodia and Myanmar oh. last year, so. I'm hoping to go to Shiva. India too. Yeah, That's India. just me doing psychedelia for a local poster. <laughs> that's funny. Um, and that's another one I did for the, um, the museum, the local museum. Okay. Yeah, that's that sort of, it can definitely sort of they look like here, the, uh, that's me. Okay. You know, barefoot, the hair, you know, that's sort of me. Um, yeah. That's Mara. Okay. And that's from Mara. And you can see where the Aluna drawing came from. Is that yeah. you know, that style that I work in, that super textured, beastly kind of style. Mm -hmm. And then that's from the Mara that's coming out from Fanographic. So you're getting a sneak preview of something that's unreleased. Okay. Um, that's from the same Mara that's still coming out. Okay. Um, you know, this is a pretty detailed drawing. Yeah, a lot of detail. That was one of my favorite drawings from the Dragonomicon that got oh. the drawing got rejected. I was so pissed off because um, that was the best drawing I did for that book and they left it out. They paid mm -hmm. me for it, but they didn't put it in. Well, that's a bummer. Another Dungeons and Dragons drawing I did way back when. Uh -huh. It's one of my favorite early Dungeons and Dragons drawings I did. Yeah. More Dungeons and Dragons stuff. That's another one of my favorites. It's great. I like the, you know, I like playing with the idea of, of a troll instead of it being in a ferocious, horrible thing, you know, it's doing this delicate thing of gardening. Mushrooms. Yeah, it's more of a cook troll or something. <laughs> yeah. Harvester. Another one of my favorite D&D illustrations that they left out of the book. Polar bear is really cool. Yeah. And that's Shiva, so. Yeah, see the influence. Anyway, right? um, so there you go. No, that's wonderful. I, I re really appreciate you sharing some of your process and some of your history. And, sure. it, and it's ex exciting to hear that you've got some more magic art coming out in the near future. Uh, sounds like you had a summer project that might we might be able to see here soon. So, but again, don't don't break any NDAs. We don't want you getting in trouble. So, I'm just saying. Um, all I'm telling you is I'm not done yet. Yeah, that's great. That's I'm awesome. Not gonna say anything more than that. I'm not done <laughs> yeah, don't don't compromise anything. So, um, so kind of winding down here. Uh, we're about out of time. Last thing I I typically like to ask if you had any advice, and and you've shared some of this already. You know, going through the 
the basics and, and doing the basics. But if you had one piece of advice for aspiring artists and and uh, illustrators, what what would that be? Well, um, as my friend the guitarist once said when asked that question, uh, do your homework, work really hard give up everything else, spend countless hours on this for years and years and years. And when you finally are ready, there's hundreds of dollars to be made every year. <laughs> yeah. Well. yeah okay. So apart from the joke of do something else, um, the advice I have to give is not advice that's often taken and it's not advice that people want to hear. But on the front end of the process, make sacrifices uh, back off on the desire to express yourself, maybe balance it out a little bit. But if you really want to get good at this, you're going to have to study anatomy. You're going to have to get light and form down. You know, I, I literally traced and redrew every image in my Bridgman's anatomy books mm -hmm. to learn anatomy. That's what I did. Trace them, drew them, flip the page. Trace, drew, flip the page. You know, it's not fun. But when Jeff Jones was asked by, oh God, is it George Pratt? I think George Pratt. Um, why are you bothering with me? Uh, and Jeff said, well, I saw that you were willing to do the stuff that wasn't fine. Mm -hmm. And so my advice is if you really, if you just want to make memoir comics for fun, do that. But sure. if you really want to draw, you got to do the shit that's not fun. You can't just draw character sketches and monsters. You got to figure out how cats work, how deer work you know, how right. humans work. And you gotta learn all that. The other bit of advice is um, stop hanging around with people your own age. Mm. As artists, I mean, hang out with them, but as, you know, as, as don't hang out with artists of your age. Don't hang out with your colleagues. Look for mentorship. Look for oh, older, yeah. look for masters. Be fearless in the pursuit of mentorship. Invite yourself over to be mentored, you know? <laughs> Just yeah. be, fear be fearless, be disciplined, be willing to make sacrifices and it's not easy once you get in. I always thought the hard part was getting in. It turned out the hard part was staying in. Oh uh, yeah. You know, so it's really just, if you really want this, there could be a heavy price to pay, but yeah. that sounds grim, but ultimately what else are you going to do? Sure. I mean, you know, not everybody wants to get a job doing what is sensible and pays well. Some of us have dreams, mm -hmm. you know, of to do these other things. And a lot of us suffer for that. You know, we don't get it. Like, I don't have insurance at the moment. Oh. You know, things yeah. like that, you know, health insurance. So sure. you, know, you have to just be willing to be realistic about what it takes. You have to be fearless. You have to be self-disciplined. Um, you have to make sure that it's what you really want. And all that said, you might be one of the lucky ones that just sails right through and everything falls into your lap. Yeah, I, I mean, you a bunch of money off. So I guess my, you know, my advice, it sounds grim, but I can only give advice based on what my experience has been, which right. has been, that it's been a battle. But, you know, that's in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, uh, Arjuna the warrior. And mm -hmm. you know, Arjuna sits down and says, "I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to fight the battle. I don't want to fight the battle." And I'm not a Krishna; I'm a Shaiva. But you know, there's great stuff in the Bhagavad Gita. And Krishna says, um, "Fight the battle, Arjuna." That's it. That's my. That is all that said. All that long-winded stuff I said. The advice of the same advice Krishna gave Arjuna: fight the battle. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I mean regardless of religion or, or, or whatever spiritual background you have, I think there's a lot of those same, uh, same stories to be told, you know, persistence is key. So really wisdom, 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 wisdom applies even if you're an atheist. Right. You know, exactly. and there, that's great wisdom whether you believe in any of it or not. Absolutely. You know, and fighting the battle means, the, the other part of that is fight the battle, but he also says, do not expect there to be any fruits. You know, you plant the tree, but if it doesn't bear fruit, it doesn't bear fruit. And, yeah. you know, you, you have no right to the fruit. You only have a right to the action. 
Sure. So commit to the action. Uh, it's hard not to worry about the fruit, but the fruit doesn't exist until it exists. True. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Um, we, I'm sure everybody who will watch this appreciates getting to know you a little bit better, and we'll hope to hear your decision soon on, on what, what your plans are for the pieces you have. Okay, I hope I didn't ramble too much. Or... No, you did great. Thank you. <laughs>